presenting with Miriam today. Um, and we're going to talk about the Canadian syncope um, uh, risk as, uh, score for today. Um, as a disclosure, we don't have any financial disclosure or conflict of interest with the presented materials in this presentation. So we'll start with a, a, a hypothetical case. We have a 60 years old male who presented who, who had syncope and presented with chest pain. He came with the, his troponin came positive with 25. His EKG was unremarkable. Uh, we uh, we identified that it's most likely he had a cardiac syncope. So in this case, what's next for this patient? Do we consult cardiology? Do we discharge the patient home and follow up uh, close with a close follow up with the cardiology? So what's how do we uh, take a decision of what to do next for for this type of presentation? So. As a background, or as, as we all know, syncope is defined as a sudden transient uh, loss of consciousness, and it's followed by spontaneous complete recovery. Uh, and syncope constitute of one to, two, uh, to 3% of all emergency department visits, and up to 3% of them gets hospitalized from the ED. And, uh, and it, um, uh, sorry, and 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 for the hospital, and, uh, and usually the hospital uh, and the literature show, sorry, has uh, shown that hospital admission due to syncope were associated with low mortality or the need for any procedures. And we, as emergency physician, we are all posed with the task of determining if this patient might be considered as a low, medium, or high risk of a serious outcome. So uh, several risk assessment tools has been developed to help with the identification of uh, how to um, uh, the predis like the disposition of the patient and where to go. Uh, one of these score is the Canadian syncope risk score. Uh, however, it wasn't validated. Uh, and this paper that we are presenting now is the paper that uh, came out to validate the Canadian syncope risk assessment uh, risk score. Uh, so, what was the aim of the study? It, it was to answer the question, can the Canadian syncope risk as a, a score help in decision making for emergency department patients with syncope based on a short term serious outcome? Uh, this study was based, was based on a previous study that was done in 2000, uh, that was sorry, published in 2016, and that study was the data collection of that study was from 2010 to 2015. And it, uh, it came up with a score system to help for, uh, for syncope. And, uh, and the component of the study included three parts, which the first one, clinical evaluation. And it was if the syncope was vasovagal or the patient has any history of heart diseases, or if the patient presented with hypo or hypertension, which was identified as uh, systolic blood pressure of less than 90 and systolic blood pressure above 180. The second component was investigations, which were the troponin, the, if there was any abnormal QRS axis, or if the QRS uh, duration was more than 130, or if the corrected QT interval was more than 480. And the last component was the diagnosis in the emergency department, which was based on the clinical um, decision of the uh, emergency physician, which was either it was a vasovagal syncope or a cardiac syncope. Uh, to you, Maria. Okay, so speaking about the previous study, which was published, uh, they divided the groups based on the risk um, uh, assessment uh, for, to five groups. The, um, the very low, low, medium, and high, and very high group uh, or risk group. Um, and the total scores were divided between or were um, uh, obtained between minus three to 11. And as you can see here, the uh, risk assessment for those groups uh, based on the results, uh, it started from 0 0.4 to 0.7% to about um, 28 uh, to 83% for the high, very high group. Um, the other thing is this is a memory aid for anyone who's interested to look at the, uh, the score and memorize the score and we're going to share it after the presentation. 
So this is study, uh, the, the validation study was a prospective cohort validation study, and it was done from the year of 2014 to 2018. It involved nine Canadian emergency departments, and it was uh, uh, done across uh, four uh, provinces in Canada. It included Ontario, Quebec, uh, Manitoba, and uh, Vancouver, or British Columbia. <laughs> Uh, in this study, they included any patient who had a syncopal event within 24 hours and all patients 16 years and above. They had multiple exclusion criteria, which were prolonged loss of consciousness, if there was any change in the mental status from their baseline, or if there was a witness seizure, if the patient had a head trauma or other traumas requiring admissions, or if there was unable to provide history, either due intoxication or if there was a language barrier. And uh, the last one was obvious arrhythmias or non-arrhythmic serious conditions on presentation. Initially, they screened about uh, 13,706 patients. And after the exclusion criteria, there were 5,133 eligible patients. However, due to loss of follow-up or uh, uh, people who were missed or there was a serious outcome, the, uh, the final uh, uh, eligible um, population was 3,819 patients. So speaking about the characteristic of those patients who were involved in this uh, validation study, as you can see, uh, the number of total patients was about 3,819 patients. Uh, with a mean age of uh, 53. Um, and as you can see here, like most of those patients were female. And uh, I mean, talking about syncope and female, I would say like it, it might be a bit dramatic when it comes to female population. Um, but yeah, I mean, there were like about 54% of those uh, patients were female. Um, going back to what the, um, uh, going to the management and ED and what those patients got, so as you can see here, like 97% uh, of those patients got an ECG while 3% were did not have any ECG at the baseline. Um, and about 8% of those patients were hospitalized for further management. So uh, we're gonna speak about the method. So uh, Dan again explained what they did so far and this uh, to validate this uh, score. So basically the patient were prospectively enrolled both the prior and after the publication of the initial uh, study. For the patient who were enrolled after the uh, Canadian syncope risk assessment uh, risk score, uh, the ED physicians and the resident who were involved in the enrollment of the patient were trained on the study protocol with one hour detective session and they were not uh, aware of the risk assessment score be be while they were enrolling the, 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 the patient. And the treating ED physician and the resident were under, uh, under, uh, under, the, under their direct supervision. They confirmed the eligibility of the patient, obtained the verbal informed consent, and completed the data collection form. And as I mentioned, this estimated risk of the serious outcome associated with each risk level was not on the data collection form to prevent the physician from uh, making any disposition decision based on that risk assessment. For uh, yeah, for in, in this method as uh, in this study as well, they did a, a proper or they did a multi-step approach to follow up for these patients. They undertook as uh, they did it as a three-step approach. And what they did is the first the first step was they undertook a structural review of all available data uh, uh, for the medical records from the index. Uh, uh, um, ER visit as well as at any subsequent ED visit in the in the in after the enrollment and any hospitalizations or death were also recorded and they involved all the investigations that were done uh, in the initial visit and, and as an outpatient visits afterwards. The second step they did is they did a scripted telephone follow up immediately after the thirty days uh, of uh, of the enrollment and or after the presentation of uh, after 30 days of the presentation and the third step was they also reviewed uh, they did a review of administrative health records for any return visit outpatient investigation or hospitalization at all local 
uh, adult hospitals for for all the patients that were involved in the in the study across all um, provinces that were involved as well as they reviewed all uh, coroner's uh, records especially in ontario because there were patients who either lost follow-up or they didn't know what happened to them so they did a coroner review just to have uh, identification of any sudden or unexpected death of these patients Okay, so uh, speaking about the outcome of this uh, of this validation study, so uh, they were looking of I would say like every kind of outcome they were expected. So starting from death um, and involving the cardiac uh, any cardiac event that happened to those patients, for example, uh, MI, um, uh, aortic dissection, pulmonary embolism, um, and also they involved any neurological uh, outcomes uh, such as subarachnoid hemorrhage or any patient who had any significant um, uh, hemorrhage uh, who did to 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 be uh, to have a syncope, and any other serious conditions such as ectopic pregnancy. So they also included any kind of arrhythmia that will lead to that mean that will cause the patient to have syncope. Uh, they did not specify uh, I mean certain arrhythmias. They, this, these are the list of all arrhythmias they were looking at uh, in case in, I mean um, in term of outcome. So. Um, now we just, I'm going to go through the table of the outcome. I mean, the serious outcome that is very important here. So it's going to give us an idea, like if we need to rely or if we can rely on this validation yet. Um, so let's just start here by looking at the total number of cases. Uh, they were screened, so it's about 3,000 and about 1,139 patients who were um, had any uh, had a serious outcome which was divided to either arrhythmogenic uh, uh, outcome or non-arrhythmogenic uh, outcome. And as we, call, uh, and we as all can see here, 13 patients died uh, afterward. But when we go, uh, I mean, when we look at the number of patients who are divided in those groups, as you can see here, like there are about like 2000 cases in very low and low risk uh, level uh, groups compared to the very high and high levels group, which is about 200. Uh, when, I mean, obviously, like the more score you got, the more serious outcome that the patient might have. And this is what happened actually when it comes to the 30-day uh, serious outcome um, to uh, on these patients. So uh, this is just um, uh, a way that how they did basically, how, how they collected their results. So it's basically they... Um, they predicted the uh, the probability of a serious outcome, and then they observed what is the probability of that outcome. And we, as we can uh, all see here, it's almost the same kind of like prediction. Like it's kind of similar. There is no big differences between the prediction and the observed probability serious outcome. Uh, I would say this is the most important slide in the whole uh, presentation. Uh, it's because it tells us it tells us about the sensitivity and the specificity of this score, and if we can rely on it or not. So as we can see here, uh, in terms of when it comes to the very low and low uh, risk group, um, so uh, the sensitivity of this score it's about 95 to 99 percent um, in those groups compared like uh, to the other groups, when you look at the sensitivity, the more score the, the patient got, the less sensitive the test get, uh, it, be, it becomes. And, and when you look at the specificity, so it's also like it's higher in the medium and high group uh, compared to the uh, other groups, because I mean, it's rule in uh, the serious outcomes, obviously, when it comes to higher scores. Now, um, this is, I mean, now we're going to go through a discussion, me and Dana, about the study. And uh, um, we're going to discuss about uh, multiple things that they did or they did not do. Um, and afterward, we're going to open the floor for more for further discussion uh, with you guys. So did the study address a clearly focused issue? What do you think, Dana? Uh, they have identified clearly what they're looking for, and they clearly identify what is syncope in this study, and and they got they had a clear definition of their risk uh, score uh, with a, uh, with the multiple components, and they did address how to risk assess all the patients and where the disposition uh, afterwards. 
So yeah, as mean you as you said, like it's they were clearly had um, an issue that where they were looking at, which is the syncope and the serious outcome uh, afterward. And uh, I mean, what we need to do when, to prevent the that uh, serious outcomes. Um, so basically, uh, I mean, the next question says like, where the cohort recruited and I mean, the unacceptable way. Uh, I think they did. It, it was a, an acceptable way. They had multiple uh, people involved in from multiple provinces and multiple large ED um, uh, emergency departments were as well involved. And they blinded both the residents and the physicians when, when they did the enrollment of the syncopal patients. And they had a clear uh, guidelines of who should be in the, in the study or not. Okay, so yeah, they, they have fairly um, uh, a large, I mean, um, ex, um, exclusion criteria, which I agree, like they, I mean, they included who's like above 16 and who has a clear history of syncope. So even if anyone has a language barrier, they were excluded, which is, which is, I would say like, it's a good point for them. Um, so coming to the exposure, they were like accurately, um, I mean, they were accurately uh, measured. Um, I mean, I would, I would answer this question uh, by saying no. I mean, they, uh, I would say not all patients had an, the same clear exposure when it comes to uh, the initial assessment. Um, as I mentioned earlier, about 3% of the patient did not have an ECG as a baseline. And about like, uh, I mean, going through the article, I, we found that like 50% of those patients did not have the troponin as a baseline. Uh, which I would say that this is one of, I mean, these two uh, criteria are one of the, are two of the most important criteria in the, um, in the score, which gives us either like higher uh, points when it, when it comes to calculation. Uh, so that's, yeah, I would say no, not everyone had the same exposure in terms of, um, uh, I mean, in when it's come in the study. Yeah. And was the outcome accurately measured to minimize bias? So um, I'm just trying to remember. Uh, I think we, we said about we said yes about it. Like everyone had. Uh, um, I mean, yeah. So we, we div they divided the outcomes actually, like to into cardiac, non-cardiac, uh, what other outcomes, and that that was accurately saying like yeah, those patients had in cardiac outcomes, and those are did, I mean did not have any cardiac outcome, uh, which. As an emergency gives us idea of what we are scared of and what we are looking as uh, on those patients as an outcome, like why we gonna be uh, hesitant to send these patients home. So um, by dividing the number of cases on, I mean, uh, divided the cases based on the outcomes, they did that well actually, and uh, especially in the maybe the first table. But there is other tables we we did not share here. Where, uh, it tells us like. Uh, um, what the outcomes, uh, what, what was the outcomes? Yeah. So the next question would be, have the authors identified all important co-founding factors? Um, for this study, I would say they, they did involve a lot, like a large number of people and they gave the ages above 16, like, any patient about 16 and above, but they didn't uh, specify uh, their the the endpoint of the age group. That's one. And the other thing is the majority of the patient involved in the study are young, healthy patients and had no comorbidities, and they were all in the low risk group. And that's why the low risk group had a, a major like the highest number of uh, of patients. Uh, what and also like uh, adding to that, uh, as you said, like they did not mention like which patient has what as a background, for example, heart disease, any other diseases. Uh, and they included anyone who's above 16, which I would say like, er, um, I mean, the younger are you, the less um, risk factor that you will have a serious cardiac or serious any other outcome um, from this score. So, um, I mean, also like giving um, the fact that um, those patients, the mean age of these patients was like 50, 50 is considered as like, it's very young and it's less likely that it would have something serious that will keep these patients in the emergency. Mm -hmm. um, 
And do you think that they uh, they thought about the confounding factor and I mean, in their analysis, I think we agreed that they did not also like specify what is it and when they when they came to the um, to the design and the analysis. Okay. Uh, okay, so was the follow up of subjects complete enough? I mean, Dana likes this question, so she's going to answer it. <laughs> for me, uh, the follow-up that was done for this patient was very complete and con like uh, precise. They did it on a three-step uh, approach. Uh, they collected all the data necessary during the first visit and multiple um, uh, future visits, either in the emergency or as an outpatient. So they got all the health records, all the... Um, all the information after the syncopal attack. Uh, the second approach, they did a, a scripted telephone uh, follow-up, which was good. And the last one was all, and all was also within 30 days of the event. And the last one was they also got all the records and they checked the coroner's offices just to make sure that any cardiac, uh, any sudden or unexpected death that happened to the patient and why it happened. So I think they did a very complete uh, follow-up. Okay. Um, and uh, do you think that they have a long enough uh, follow-up afterward when they, I mean, when they're like collecting the data, like 30 days, do you think it's enough? I think 30 days after the first episode is, uh, is an uh, acceptable length of the follow-up um uh, as uh, as what happened to the patient after 30 days if they or before the 30 days is very important to to know the the outcome of this in, after the syncopal attack yeah and they were uh they were actually uh, mentioning like in which day these events happened like for example like uh, mi uh, any kind of arrhythmias any kind of other uh, outcomes they specified in which in which dates uh, these uh, these outcome happens, which is I, I think it's it's very good in terms of like prediction in long uh, long run to those patients. Um, How precise are the results? So basically, uh, the uh, when it comes to the confidence interval of the results they got, uh, I mean it was a, like they had a sensitivity about like uh, ninety three to ninety nine percent. Was a specificity of a, com of a confidence interval of specificity about uh, 42 to uh, I think 45 percent. Mm -hmm. So um, I would consider that precise, precisely in terms to the results. So I would say like it's it was like precise enough to to get these results. I mean, in the first place. Can the results be applied to the local population? Well, the study was done in Canada across multiple provinces, and it can be applied to our uh, clinical practice here in, in Quebec. However, I think it needs more uh, or further other studies that need to be validated across maybe Europe, Middle East or East Asia just to apply it for other local populations. Okay, which is, uh, yeah, as I said, like I agree, it needs more, I mean, it needs further validation. Uh, at this point, um, especially with the high number of very low and low risk patients, mm -hmm. which we don't have a clear idea about the high and very high patients, uh, because the number were fairly not equal in the both groups. So we can say like, yeah, it's okay, we can use it. Um, uh, I mean, how can we imply, uh, uh, how can we apply this uh, study uh, in our practice? Uh, if any one of the staff would like to give us an idea like if what do you, what do they think uh about the about the score how it's going to change our um um i mean our disposition of those patients anyone would like to I mean, I guess um, the study. I mean, the study was well done, and and I liked a lot of part of it. But um, it kind of seems a little bit obvious to me in a way. I guess I don't know how to really phrase it. I guess if you look at the score, um, essentially what it's saying is that if you have a patient um, that has a clinically sounding history of vasovagal syncope. 
as a normal EKG and trope, and then you diagnose it as likely being syncope and normal vitals, then they're in a very low risk category. And so what this validation study gives you essentially is that people who you already think are very low risk are in fact very low risk to have a, a, a high risk outcome. Um, so it's nice to have some data to back up um, what I think a lot of people are already doing. It gives us information about patients that we, I guess, think probably have a vasovagal syncope um, and maybe have just uh, a history of heart disease or something like that. Um, you know, this gives us a little bit more information to go on. Um, but anybody with uh, either an abnormal EKG, an elevated trope, uh, and maybe abnormal vitals, you're kind of stuck putting them into a higher risk category. So um, I have to say, I haven't really started using this rule. Um, hasn't really changed the way I still approach syncope patients. It's maybe just made me a little bit more comfortable in sending patients who I've already thought were low risk um, home, I guess. Okay. I don't know so what you other think, people think. You think that it's, it's more of like a kind of like improvement that what we're doing is maybe the appropriate way for those patients, especially in the very low and low group when it comes to, um, I mean, the total score and when it comes that they are at low risk of any serious outcome in the next 30 days. Yeah, I think it gives some justification to the patients who I think uh, prior to the using this rule, who we were told were low risk, do look to be low risk using this rule. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. Okay. All right. Thank you, Audrey. That being, I was going to say that being said, um, I just, similar to the Ottawa um, subarachnoid rule, I wonder if 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 using kind of a, a rule like this blindly um, could end up with increased hospitalizations if you end up putting a lot of patients into the higher risk category where you might not have um, prior to using the the rule. Um, exactly. Yeah. Yeah, this is this is the other point. Like, if you turn, I mean, if you tend to use this rule more, maybe like as you said, like we're gonna increase. I mean, by the end, like increase the length of a stay in ED or like hospitalization to patients who are maybe at low risk. That way, they might guide. They might get anything after. Uh, I mean, in the third, in the next thirty days, based on the initial presentation. Okay, so um, we're gonna go, uh, we're gonna continue the- uh... With the strength and limitation of the study. Yeah. So the strength of the study, it's, it's because it was done in multi-center uh, emergency medicines in Canada, including many, uh, the biggest EDs in the provinces. So that's a big point uh, of a, like a strength point. Uh, they had only 3.7% of the patients who were lost to follow up. So it's a small number. Uh, they had a sensitivity for the low risk patient uh, of 97.8%, uh, which makes us more comfortable sending these patients home, as you guys discussed. Uh, attempted to, uh, because, because, we, uh, because they did a blinding of the uh, ED position, they attempted to reduce the bias when the ED position and the uh, resident enrolled the patients in, in, the, in the study, and they had a sample size um, that met the recommendation for the validation studies of, predict, uh, of prediction uh, tools. Yeah, which is about, uh, it's a minimum of 100 cases who was exposed and minimum of 100 cases who did not, I mean, did not have the exporter. Uh, so uh, regarding the limitation of this study, um, as we said, like as I mentioned earlier, the number of patients were higher in the, um, in the low and very low group, which uh, gives us an idea like why it's high sensitivity, I mean, why it's high sens sensitive in those uh, two groups. Um, and then patient number of the very, very high and high uh, group are very low. So in term, when it comes to that, uh, groups, we can't rely on these, um, uh, I mean, they have less sensitivity, so we can't rely on these, um, on, the, on the sensitivity of those patients. Uh, so, I mean, your, uh, the ED physician experience and uh, asking for consultation from other services, I mean, from other services would be uh, warranted in this case. Um, 
we as we can uh, also we as 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 mentioned also when I was discussing with Audrey the this court might lead to increased hospitalization when it comes to outcome uh, because I mean not all every patient needs to be hospitalized for further management especially that we can do it as an outpatient in the clinic or in um, any other um, hospital visits. Um, so that's why it's uh, sometimes, I mean, if any patient has a high score, it's, I mean, obviously you need to ask for, for somebody else to um, risk stratifies those patients. But in the other patient, which is, I would say like, you don't think they might have something, they are healthy, they are doing good. Um, hospitalizing these patients will increase, will, will increase the length of AD stay. So also regarding the uh, ECG that we're missing and the, uh, and the troponin uh, percentage where we're missing an initial assessment, this is a significant point, I would say like, uh, I mean, uh, addressing this issue, especially when it's, it comes to, uh, I mean, this is important for, uh, for, for measuring the score. Uh, I know that it want, I mean, the, the physician at that time did not measure the score uh, to, to prevent the bias, uh, but also like 50% of those patients did not have the troponin is a quite large number of those patients in the city. Um, and again, like, uh, I mean, external validation is warranted for other uh, general uh, sites uh, because this is only what was, what, what was done in um, any Canadian sites. So maybe like further hospitals, further um, like EDs need to be involved to especially including more high and very high patients um, to, to do this uh, kind of validation to know like, um, is, are, are we doing the right thing by hospitalizing them? Or maybe we're just keeping them for unnecessary management afterward, which can be done as an outpatient. So to conclude our discussion here today, uh, we would say like um, the, the CSRS uh, is, a, is a validated tool to, it might be a good tool to determine very low and low risk uh, patient uh, when it comes to the serious outcome. So, I mean, you can, you can, you can use the tool to, to discharge those patient or to risk a start to abuse patient who has syncope. Uh, but not in the patient who is having like medium, high or high, uh, very high risk, um, especially when it comes to like patient safety and healthcare, I mean, efficiency. So um, now we're gonna open the floor for further discussion from anyone who has any question or any points that, um, uh, I mean, it's good to share the, the, uh, the opinions about the article. Thank you guys. Um, Welcome. I mean, I just, I think what I would say, I'd agree mostly with what uh, Audrey has said. I think the early Ottawa rules, like the knee and ankle rules or the CT head rule were much more straightforward in what they were trying to achieve, which is to help you decide whether to do a diagnostic imaging test. They're now coming out with scores, which are essentially trying to determine your disposition decision, which is much more complex. And I'd be very surprised if this score offers anything that we don't already have from unstructured clinician judgment. Um, so I'd be surprised if this is significantly under change practice. And I think they would need much more robust evidence to show that it does. And essentially they would need to compare the effects of unstructured clinician judgment to using this score and to actually prove that it leads to meaningful changes in patient outcomes, which honestly I'd be surprised if it does. Yeah, especially in the like high and very high group, uh, I mean, as you said, like we need to know, like if they validate, I mean, further validate this score, like would it change anything? Like maybe we're keeping them for a long time, or maybe not, or maybe we're doing the right thing now for yeah. these patients. Um, so yeah. Yeah. Uh, okay. It doesn't look like we have uh, any more comments yet. Like you saying, we should do an RCT. Uh... Can I make a comment? Yeah, sure. Go ahead. Hi, uh, everyone. My name's Nick. I'm a current med for working on my applications for ER. But um, I know that this, these same authors uh, published a study, I think it was in early 2019, um, where they looked at the Canadian syncope risk score. And they also looked at um, if they were to add ECG monitoring in the ER, 
um, how that might help or affect the score. And I remember their conclusions being that um, with uh, two hours of ECG monitoring, half of the patients that were uh, categorized as low risk by the risk score, um, they found what they called a serious uh, rhythmic outcome in those patients with just two hours of monitoring. Um, do you, how, how would that would, uh, sort of affect how you might apply this, this rule or does that just kind of change some of your considerations for this? Uh, you mean like if, um, uh, if they use the, uh, I mean, in, in the ECG monitoring instead of uh, like calculating the rule? And the, they, both. They, they, they risk stratified them with, with the risk score and they also had uh, ECG monitoring on these patients. And the ones in the low risk group with just two hours of monitoring, they would find an arrhythmia in about half of those patients. I, I think that would also justify your point of most of the patients didn't have an EKG initially. Yeah, and, and the other thing, if I'm getting your question right, is, um, I mean, Putting those patients, the very low or low risk patient in ECG monitoring, I mean, in two hours, I mean, there is low, like there is less, uh, I mean, they, they, um, the, um, I mean, the way that you might find something in those ECG in two hours is less, especially if they are healthy at the baseline. And if they don't, I mean, if they don't have any back, I mean, medical condition as a background. So, um, uh, one, I mean, uh, one of the discussion that, I mean, about this article was uh, how often that you might find something, like for example, a VTAC or v, v, a VFIB in those patients, uh, if, if you keep them in the emergency, like in, in the first place in two hours or in the next 30 days. Uh, and when it happened, like how you can prevent that? If, for example, if they presented and they didn't, they didn't have any structural or any kind of abnormality when it comes to at the first, I mean in the initial presentation so um, so that's why like we were saying uh, even if you put this patient in an ECG monitoring for two hours three hours in the ED uh, would you would you find anything that would I mean ask you as an emergency physician to intervene at that point in those healthy patients Fair enough. I don't know if I answered your question or not. Yeah, no, no, I, un I understand your point. Just magnifying sort of some of the concerns you have with the risk score in general, that uh, these are already low risk patients and sort of if you're ECG monitoring them, then uh, you might you might find something, but that fi something is, is unlikely to be relevant uh, anyways. And I, I, th I think in their 2019 study, uh, all the, the patients that they did find, uh, none of them had death or ventricular um, tachycardia anyways. So cool, thank you. You're welcome. Any other questions, comments? Any other, I mean, anyone who would like to share uh, if they used it uh, so far, um, I mean, a sick of the patient? I just wanna say there's there's 3% of patients that actually didn't even have EKGs that like, I don't know if the EKGs were lost or if they just, somebody was gutsy and decided not to do the one test that is recommended like by Rosens. <laughs> the 10 minutes. Like, <laughs> shall, like a little gutsy, I don't know. Yeah, I agree. Yeah, that was a bit of like, why it's not all of them had an ECG. I mean, it's, I mean, it's relevant, like syncope ECG. All right, uh, I mean, if you don't, I mean, if, uh, there's no other questions. Uh, Looks like that's yeah. it. Hello. Hello. <laughs> my comment, it's Ken Doyle here. My comment is, for me, clinically, the most important thing is distinguishing between vasovagal syncope versus other. And the other category contains other things than cardiac, the main one being PE. And this study doesn't help with that. Yeah, I mean, uh, we if we looked at the score, we can't. I mean, if I if I go back, we can't. Uh, there is no like point of like okay, this patient might have a PE, which is I agree. Yeah. Uh, here. So yeah, it's it's I mean, either like you think it's vasovagal syncope or it's a cardiac syncope. So, and it's this is when it comes also to physician gestalt, which. We don't like to use this term, uh, but yeah, I mean, there is like two points of the, I mean, from the score that it says, okay, like 
you decide about it as a physician. Is it basal vagal or is it cardiac? So this is subjective, I would say, uh, points uh, that is going to change significantly when it comes to the score. And I guess can I just, argue uh, if you have. Let me just point out that um, uh, with respect to val deriving a score um, for diagnosis, it's nice to have the final diagnosis in the ED, but when you're working with this clinically, you don't have the final diagnosis. You're looking for a diagnosis. You're using the score to try and help you find a diagnosis. So therefore, uh, I find those last two points, the diagnosis in the ED, very non-helpful uh, as a clinician because I I'm, using, I'm looking for a score that helps me determine if it's vasovagal or cardiac not a score that tells me if I thought it was cardiac, is it really cardiac? So you can ignore those two as far as I'm concerned. And therefore you're left with a baseline, but the, the lowest you can get is minus one. And if you talk about a score with just one point, you've got a risk of, uh, what is that, um, already uh, uh, 3% for one, uh, one per, uh, a score of one gives you a 3% risk of syncope. So overall, the score is not that discriminatory unless the patient's had a previous history of vasovagal symptoms and you're already pretty sure the patient is basal vagal. Otherwise, a lot of uh, concerns, um, although it does help quantify some of the concerns about what the EKG findings might be. So I'll, overall, I don't find a very useful clinical score. So yeah, I mean, uh, I agree on uh, the point that it needs, I mean, this score needs to help us to determine what we need to do. I mean, uh, rather than asking us like, is it basal vagal or cardiac? Yeah. 